So uh, welcome back to the podcast that refuses to die. <laughs> <laughs> and this week we're going to be discussing turf wars. Are we actually going to use that as the title for it? <laughs> we absolutely are. Okay. Since we're going with the name TERF, that stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. <laughs> uh, so we've got quite a packed house. So I'm Chris, joined by Tucker from Tucker 5 Law Account. Free Caledonia is here, and Stephen Payton from The National. What we're talking about is turf wars. Mm. The, the, the issue seems to be within the feminist community, which is normally a very nice community, there are elements within it. I'm, I'm just going to say the feminist community is not a very nice community. It's not? It's not, and it never has been. Oh no, there, are, there are nice people, and there are arseholes. Jermaine well, Greer, for yeah. instance, has always been an arsehole. <laughs> well, what percentage would you say? Uh, I, I would say 15%. <clears throat> 15% are our 15% of feminists okay. are our souls. So we're, that's what we're here I've to talk about, I've made that up it? entirely. Okay. So we're talking about the, the 15% that of the feminist community are dicks. Yeah. So why are they being dicks, I think is the question. And Stephen, you can probably give us some background as to what the fuck is going wrong with all this. Sure. I mean, well, basically, there's a, there's this kind of small but very loud minority within the feminist movement that is opposed to primarily trans women having access to women-only spaces. And it's always trans women. They never talk about trans men. They never talk about any other identity because that sort of undermines their argument for the most part. And this kind of small group within the feminist community sort of acts like it speaks for everyone. So we constantly see it in the press. We constantly see it in any debate that's put up. It's always framed as a feminists versus trans people or trans activists but the reality is actually it's one small group of feminists versus other feminists and the trans community um, but instead it's kind of always shoehorned onto this very black and white concept when in fact it's it's kind of a lot more nuanced and usually it's couched in terms that are very much I guess reminiscent of like your kind of gay panic period of time in the 80s and everything else uh with bizarre things like um obviously during the 80s there was like the whole thing uh, this bizarre idea of like all oh, people can catch the gay with, with <laughs> section 28 in schools is like oh if we teach about the gay then people will get the gay and and it's exactly the same right now um like this this small group of anti-trans activists have come up with this completely non-peer-reviewed concept called rapid onset gender dysphoria which just basically means um, if your kid hangs around with other trans kids, then they will catch the trans, and then they will have rapid onset gender dysphoria, where they'll suddenly become a trans person. But what that really means is, the kid's been trans for a long time, and it's just finally came out. As it would be with like anyone who is gay. You know, it's the same basic yeah. deal. It's like, you wouldn't say someone just turned gay because this is the first time they've told you about it. It's been there for a while. The thing is, when you don't have a name for something, if it's not discussed, you might not you might not understand as a teenager. You might not have understood 40 or 50 years ago what it was that you were feeling if you were gay, if you didn't have a name for it, if you didn't have a concept of it. That's what language does. It language by giving names to concepts makes them into real things to a certain extent so there's this idea somehow that if we don't talk about it that it will go away and what's actually happening is so perhaps there is a, an expansion of people identifying in much more sort of plural ways than there was before that's not because it's somehow contagious it's because by it becoming something that's more acceptable and um, people understanding about it and knowing about it. People who identify somewhere on that spectrum know what they are and have a name for it and can give voice to it and feel comfortable giving voice to it. That's not the same as it being something that you can catch by hanging around the toilets. <laughs> exactly. It's just something that we've got a better understanding of now. Yeah. It's like trans people aren't new. Being around forever is recorded instances of people who have been sort of out with their gender as far back as we can go yeah. but instead it's, a, it's almost like it's a trending new thing in fact one of the groups um that has been part of like these like touring debates about let's talk about the gender recognition act and they're acting like we're, we're just gonna have an objective chat about it one of the groups groups is called transgender trend because they think it's just this trend um, and they've been actually part of pulling together a school resource pack 
that specifically basically said exactly that. It's like, don't don't talk about it. That's the best guidelines. They're saying like that's that should be the guidelines for teachers. And then when people tried to get it blocked because of the fact that actually it was advocating really a dangerous way of dealing with it, um, because of like the high level of like self harm and suicide within the trans community for kids who don't know what they're going through. Um, when people try to get it blocked, they started this other campaign saying that schools were blocking LGBT resources because it wasn't taking their resource, even though their resource was objectively bad, uh, and went against, again, all the science. It's, it's I think, a really Western-focused lack of historical knowledge stands to take that transgender people have just kind of popped up in the last little while. I mean, if you look around the world, there's instances everywhere of third genders being recognised, some communities that recognise up to five genders. That was all there, and the British Empire played a pretty good part in quashing that and instead instilling a very British, there are only two genders and we will not deviate from um, yeah, gender I mean, norms. Iran has uh, really, really good gender laws for, uh, that they recognise uh, essentially a third sex mm. uh, and have done for years and you know the, their equivalent whatever their equivalent of the NHS is there's there's assistance for and, and all those things you know, if Iran can get its head around this yeah we should probably be able to make an effort should. I mean when, when I was in school directly or indirectly we were taught there were only two genders there, at no point that to my knowledge that I was ever really discussed I mean, the complexities of sexuality in terms of, like, pansexuality would be a good example of it. And like, that wasn't discussed, you know. And it's just incredible how... It, you don't want to get too kind of anti-government here about things, but... Oh, but I, I know. <laughs> but ultimately, it is kind of taught. And I've certainly felt that I've been throughout my whole 20s and now into my 30s playing catch-up on stuff that, to me, should be there by default within the education system. But it, it isn't. I think the c controversy in like libertarian circles comes when um, it appears to be that there's like um, people are play uh, asking you to act in a certain way that you don't want to act in. So, well, you know, libertarians would all always be for folk expressing themselves and being who they want. Um, when it comes to like using certain words and stuff like that, it's when it becomes a bit more difficult and more controversial. So, like the whole like. Um, pronouns type thing um, that's probably a bit more a bit more difficult for some people to get their head around. Um, yeah I mean the terminology thing is like an adjustment is there any feeling of adding in new words to the language or are we merely adjusting with the words that we've currently got? That yeah. I think is a question that's worth mm. asking. Is that... Well I mean I think that? I think that's, you've kind of hit it on the head there like a lot of the contention around like they them, um, which uh, I guess for clarity, I am a they them we're taking something that we're coming to terms with and grasping and understanding a lot more now, better, and fitting that into a language that was not built for that. It's a language that's been around for, yeah, there's uses of they as a singular dating way back. I'm pretty sure Shakespeare did it. So, I mean, if, if it was around then, yeah. and he's the pinnacle of English literature, you know, can well, we I'm argue with Shakespeare? <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's like, I get that it, there's a couple of sentences that that could be a confusing thing, but that's because we're working with what we have yeah. in that sense. And there are mm -hmm. technically pronouns that have been invented since then to try and get around with things like Z and Zier. I personally, if people want to use them, fire in. I think it's too complicated to start bringing in those sort of brand new pronouns <laughs> now. My opinion is that I think the language has to evolve and new words have to be added because the level of complexity to all this stuff it is it's far too fucking complicated to work within a language as simple as English. Mm. And I think that would be good, but I'm not maybe advocating for a, you know, kind of finger wagging, you all have to do this kind of thing. Mm. I just think if people started seeing it in bars, yeah. restaurants, out so, in the street, it would just come in. Clarify really quickly, yeah, sorry, I know you're going to come in. Um, when I'm talking about it's easier, um, I'm not saying it's like... Cause I don't want to annoy anyone who uses those pronouns. I mean, more like, I think it'd be more of a stretch for us as a society is to pick that up than just readapting they them is kind of the yeah. point I was trying to make mm -hmm. there. Yeah. I mean, I think all of this, unfortunately, it, it will take time. It's not going to be like an overnight process. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it will be a couple of generations. In the same way, you know, 
black civil rights movement of the 60s, you know, when you then contrast that with Barack Obama being elected, like it took a while to get from there to there. And I think, unfortunately, with this, there is going to be time, you know, to, to get to that point. I think one of the reasons that trans women specifically seem to take a lot of hate is that it comes from two very specific mindsets, I think, within a lot of men who are misogynistic. It's like, first of all, they hate women. So that's one reason to hate trans women. And two, they hate men who are feminine in any way. And that's how they view trans women. So it's a combination of like, their hatred of, me- of women and their hatred of gender non-conforming men. Combine that, you've got a trans woman and a perfect place to be angry at as a result. Yeah, I, I think you you also have the um, sort of cowboys are frequently secretly fond of each other thing to contend with as well, which is that a lot of men are not actually that confident about their own masculinity and uh, they project that outwards by all of the things that you've just said. It, it's not because of confident masculinity. A man that's confident about his masculinity doesn't have to fucking beat up people, mm. does he? Because he knows he's okay. Some people who have been sort of pushed into being like high profile transgender people, um, I think politically, are folk like Karen White, whose name you're probably going to get dropped, who is a rapist and a trans person. But the thing is, <laughs> men are also rapists. Women assault other women. It's something that happens, like, it doesn't matter. Just because you're trans doesn't mean you're not an asshole. <laughs> like, there's dickheads in every community. The only time, though, when you take one person from that community and then use them as a means to batter the rest of it, though, is when you're coming from a bigoted position. It's the same with anyone who's like, ah, um, terrorism, that's all Muslims. Like, you don't fucking do that and and when we come to the trans debate seeing specific individuals constantly push to the front of the debate as like an example of why you can't trust trans people it is absolutely no different and now you've got like one of those other groups fair play for women who also say we just want a reasonable debate and they're running an ad series right now with a photo of a rapist saying this rapist will be able to go into the same bathroom as your daughter. Vote against trans rights. Like, how are you asking for an, like, an objective debate when that's your ad campaign? There's there's nothing about this that's looking for an open discussion. And it's like it's not like somebody needs to be transgender or pretend that they're transgender, which is the other argument sometimes put forward. Someone will pretend to be a woman to go into a woman's bathroom to assault because guys can do that already. There's yeah, I mean, that's that. basically the plot of nuns on the run without the assault. You know, I mean, you can dress up as whatever you want. That's an issue with people being assholes. That's not an issue with people being Agreed. the thing yeah. that they pretend. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, quite a common theme on this podcast is just sort of saying like there, there are arseholes in the world, but you can't judge everyone by those arseholes. And generally speaking, as a human species, we're kind of all right, generally speaking. You've probably got roughly the same percentage of arseholes in any given community. Yes. Well, I was wanting to talk about was this comedian that was hounded off of Twitter for using the term bleeders. Carrie Ad Lloyd. Carrie Ad Lloyd. Yeah. She's just... She actually, she does a good podcast called The Grief Cast, I think it's called. It's, mm. good. Uh, it's a lot of comedians talking about death. So, from what I can gather, that uh, she was raising money. Yeah. yeah. It's basically a charity that um, tries to tackle period poverty. Yes. By making it. sure that everyone has access to what they need. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was basically raising funds for that and used the term bleeders kind of like a bit tongue in cheek, but also because, you know, trans men also have periods as do non binary people. Um, and like used an inclusive term, and then Graham Linehan got in on it. Um, that being for anyone who doesn't know, the uh, one of the people behind um, Father Ted and. <laughs> Told, that's what I love about these like um like male allies to the anti trans yeah. things where they're just like jumping in about you've let the women down says this wow. dude who um maybe may not have the same perspective as her. But anyway, uh he popped in and basically said you've let women down and then his kinda little cohort hounded her until she had to leave Twitter. And like Graham kind of talks this big game about supporting women. She's like, cool. I mean, if you're going to support women, you probably shouldn't. 
hound women off Twitter who are raising funds to tackle peer poverty. Yeah. That doesn't seem like maybe you're the good guy in this fight. Uh, well, when I was looking at comments, what jumped out at me the most was the fact that people were on there going like, men don't have periods. And I was like, I don't think you guys have got the point of this. Someone that's transitioned from being a woman to a man may still have a period. And the same thing with non-binary. That's all that was. One of the things that um, this small community argue is that by using more inclusive language, you are erasing women because you're like not saying the word women anymore, which isn't true. And if you wanted to, I guess you could go the same way the other direction. Like, well, then by your logic, we're also erasing men by creating... Um, that sort of lexicon that is also more inclusive in that thing, but you aren't focused on that because, again, it undermines your argument. So using the word bleeders there, the issue was that they saw that as, like, why not just say women? You're raising women instead of just you're being more inclusive in your choice of words. So it, and also it, making a joke about it, I think. that's like Because, I mean, you just yeah. say period have her or something like that, uh-huh. you know, instead of... Like, bleeders was obviously just... She's a comedian. The, the thing that I had um, sort of come across, which I, I mean, I, and I want to, to say I emphatically disagree with this point of view, but was that somehow, just as women are sort of uh, attaining some kind of social equality with men, men are then inviting into women's achievements by becoming women. And that that's the source of the resentment. Uh, so that men who, you know, men have grown up with male privilege and then they transition into women and uh, then are um, trying to sort of claim um, uh, a, a part of women's struggle having uh, grown up with male privilege. I think that is a steaming pile of horseshit and because I think that anybody who has had to essentially unravel their own gender identity and then come out and present themselves as something more complicated than a a straight, you know, man or a woman is going to have uh, suffered an, you know, an enormous amount probably of of prejudice, of nonsense, potential violence. Um, and the idea that somehow, oh, you've had all this male privilege, you you haven't wanted it, probably. And you probably haven't had it anyway because you will have always been um, a square brick trying to be pounded into a, a round hole. Forgive the holes, sorry. <laughs> um, but the, so the the idea somehow, oh well, you've you've had it great, and now you're just stealing our thunder, is an incredibly small-minded and unpleasant point of view. Personally, I just think you want to be a woman, great. You want to be a woman, great. Also, the other thing as well is, um, we are a tiny, tiny percentage of the population. Like, <laughs> Like, 1% of the population um, are trans in the UK. Like, we're a really small amount. I don't know how much we could possibly take (laughs) from anybody, given that there's so few of us kicking around. But the amount of arguments is so disproportionate to how many of us are there kicking around, who, in the end, are ultimately only asking for respect and to be able to just piss in a safe place, (laughs) for the most part. Do I just talk about the toilets? Because that's where we're, we're gonna we're gonna fucking end up in this shitty, no pun intended, conversation anyway. Uh, I, I'm so sick of reading this. Um, I'm just gonna come out and say I don't even like the current setup for male toilets. Um, <laughs> literally, I, I I when I was a kid, I remember I think maybe the first time I saw you know was probably in school, and I was like, well, what's what is this? Why is this in a communal event? What's going on here? Yeah, can, can I just say as as the only woman in the room? Yeah. Um, and as someone that used to work in bars and have to clean men's toilets, like, what the fuck? I mean, yeah, like, well, it, yeah, it's, the it is disgusting. You will just fucking stand and piss next to each other. What the fuck what? is that about? <laughs> and then 
then some of you can't piss because you're standing next to somebody that's pissing faster or pissing bigger than you are and then you get you, you lose your nerves so you can't piss just fucking sit down and do it guys it's a lot less messy let's hop back in a time machine here and just go back to like <laughs> back when we were living in caves or whatever right uh-huh. at no point was peeing and pooing ever a communal activity no the, no. no two guys when you know Let's I fancy a, piss a pee, together. you fancy go for yeah. it with me. Or I'm off for a shit, you fancy joining. If you had to do it at the same time, you wouldn't like use the bush right next to somebody else's bush. You would give them a bit of distance in that regard. Yes. Um, so this idea of the toilet system that we have developed as a society, I've often found to be very, very peculiar. And my dream is that one day I will live on a planet where rather than having these two separate rooms, there will just be a space filled with individual booths, perhaps akin to what you get on a plane with an individual sink you've got a sanitary bin in it and then we can all shut the fuck up about this stupid issue for it's the rest called, of the time uh, it's, it's called France Belgium <laughs> yeah. uh, just having to, if you go on holiday you will find that um, in Europe they just have unisex toilets with lots of cute so I'm going to go to France yeah. Uh, uh. Well, the thing is, I think it's disabled toilets are, you know, they're unisex. Yeah. And that, that, that's the other thing about the issue, which never really gets spoken about. But, this, but at least I now know I can go to France and tell everyone just thank that's you for the That's because we've desexualised disabled people. Yeah, and none of these crazy Christians were really advocating for disabled toilets to begin with that are now saying that the trans people cannot use Do you know there's actually regulations on, like, the... Um, like air conditioning systems or ventilation systems between male and female toilets, you have to have a very high like soundproofing. Only you because, would know. Like, it. Folk are so like sensitive about like hearing the other gender uh, or genders uh, like doing their business. I, I uh, all, every partner I've been with, uh, I'm straight, so I'm talking about women here. They they fart in front of me. I don't fucking care. And just 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 get over it. Everybody needs to get over this. It's like we we all piss poo and we've made far too big a deal out of one of the most basic things we do as a species. I mean, it's ridiculous. Think how much better gossip we'll have. That there is a, an argument for bars and clubs. We are having a safe space of sorts to jump in. But I would advocate for having your pissing pooing bit in one area and to actually have a safe space, whatever you want to call it, a private area. So if you and your pals basically are like, Sh- we're, we're in trouble here, normally what you would do is uh, do you just jump in the toilet with me. And to get around that booth problem, you would maybe have a separate area in the bar or the club that that could you know, be an idea for. I don't know if you want to expand out a little bit and talk about maybe the mainstream perception of um, the tra- trans community. Um, I'm just thinking kind of characters and films in media, how that's talked about on the news. I think like transgender representation in like TV shows is usually um, a trans person that is there to be the butt of a joke often. There is a thing with like, in, if there's a show or a film that's about or LGBT characters are at the forefront of it, it's pretty much put into the... Um, classification of LGBT cinema is in not for everyone just for this community and that's always been like kind of the othering thing with any sort of minority group and um, same with like uh you know like um the the movie Bridesmaids which I thought was great but because it was one of those ones that had like an all-female cast it was seen as a women's movie but if it was like Ocean's Eleven which is all dudes it's like well that's just normal because we've got that sort of like here's the here's the standard sort of movie it's pretty much white dudes and anything other than that is just for these like special interest groups which is nonsense but that's I think how we often view it and we have seen better representation of LGBT characters over time and that's tended to be started out as gay men really and over time sort of expanded and there are more trans characters appearing in things now and there was ITV's The Butterfly show it's like a three-parter made kind of with mermaids um, sorry, Mary Mage is a charity. Um, their their assistance to kind of tell the story of like a young child realizing that they were transgender. But that obviously got a lot of controversy because people saw it as trans propaganda in the same way that any show that had gay characters and it was seen as gay propaganda at one time. Again, it's the same arguments. But we don't have a huge amount of representation. And in terms of like what columnists in the UK write about trans people, they're pretty much all on the one side of it, which is anti-trans. Given that this apparent debate is raging on, how many columns have you read by trans people 
And I'd say the answer is probably none for the most part. Totally agree. They try and present it as simple and harmful when actually it's complicated and fine. The, the one thing that I would say is that it doesn't have to be that complicated because ultimately what it comes down to is whether or not you can bring yourself to simply be polite and respectful about other people's choices that aren't any of your fucking business. And how somebody, whether they whether you want to think that it's a choice or whether or not it's simply their expression of themselves, however you want to consider it, what somebody else professes their gender sexuality, whatever, to be, is none of your fucking business. It's just none of your fucking business. It doesn't hurt you, doesn't impede y your life in any way. It's none of your fucking business. And all that's required of you, in its simplest form, is that you have the manners to call people what they want to be called. Is that so fucking hard? The assuming the gender thing, in an office situation, someone has made an assumption then they're corrected an apology is issued and that's it and that would feel quite reasonable to me i uh, think part of the reason that it does become such a contentious issue is you get um well, if we jump back to like the tariffs thing you've got um you know radical feminists who you know have spent their whole life having to aggressively batter back against misogyny and that is like centuries long you know attaining the vote and all that kind of stuff and you've got a group of um, you know trans activists who have spent their life trying not to get murdered <laughs> and uh, just yeah. to live a normal life and you've got two groups of people who have really been struggling and having to fight and fight and fight and then you know it suddenly does become easier to do certain things but it's hard to switch off that defensiveness so anything they see that seems to be attacking them or their case they're so switched on to say no you can't do that and I think that's part of the problem you get very defensive groups of people mm. who maybe need to be a slightly more sensitive in both directions I think yeah and I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there because these <laughs> we should be fucking allies <laughs> instead of like yes. having to argue amongst ourselves about this and that's exactly it and I think you're completely right that it's like it is that thing where, where you've been fighting and struggling for so long that sometimes some slights, which maybe aren't even slights, but because everything's a potential attack, you can kind of come in on things way harder than you should because you're, you're so used to attacks coming in all directions that you can misread something and it has, as a result, made discussion difficult at times and harder to have. Like as much of a nuanced conversation and I think what we've actually seen is like a lot of otherwise like really sound writers and columnists sort of accidentally getting swept up in the rhetoric that's been used as well like it's not even people who are like trying to be malicious um, it's people who maybe have only managed to hear one side of it and thought that they have a broad understanding of it, yeah. but instead yeah. they write a column that actually perpetuates certain myths mm -hmm. um, or problems and then everyone comes in hard on them and they buckle down instead of like feeling like they can engage and it's just because everyone's kind of on, on their tiptoes. Well, I think the media is to blame for a lot of this because I think there was sort of negative anti-trans columnists that are out there. I can completely understand that um, trans people are thinking that's going to be the default setting for everybody in society. And I think you're right that it will take an awful long time for that sense of actually most people are normal. Just this, it's these weird columnist people that are the problem. <laughs> and I think that it, it will just take time for that to yeah, gradually, gradually adjust. Yeah, it'll progress one funeral at a time. There, there is an insidious element to this as well of what you're saying. Like, you know, let's say people are coming at it with like genuine faith. They think that they really are on the right side. But there is a very concerted effort if you're talking about like trying to roll back civil rights. Um, some of the funding towards groups in the UK actually comes from groups in America who have quite openly spoken this, like on recordings, you can go and watch them saying that if we want to roll back civil rights for the LGBT community, the first thing we have to do is create a wedge 
on the tee. Like, if we can start to, like, roll it back for trans people, if we can turn them against trans people, the community is smaller, and then we can keep moving forward and rolling it back for the rest of them as well. And they're really, they're open about it. They're completely blatant that that's what they want to do. So in a weird way, it's really odd to see sometimes people or groups in the UK who are lesbians working with these groups and it's like you're next (laughs) you're next on the list what the fuck are you doing the thing that i always just find bewildering is how do the the people who are trying to somehow hold back the tide of something like this how do they fail to learn from history there is only ever one side in, uh, you, you know, there's only ever one outcome with civil rights <laughs> battles, and that is that eventually the the civil rights are generally won. Okay, mm. and so if you think that you can hold back the tide of something like this, then you haven't learned anything from history at all. Rrrr. <laughs>